Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The Life and Achievements of Don Quixote de la Mancha is a Spanish epic novel by Miguel de Cervantes. Originally published in two parts, in 1605 and 1615, its full title is The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. A founding work of Western literature, it is often labeled as the first modern novel and one of the greatest works ever written. Don Quixote is also one of the most translated books in the world. If you enjoy our program, Please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 81 A continuation of Sancho Panza's government with other entertaining passages. The morning of that day arose which succeeded the governor's round, the remainder of which the gentleman waiter spent not in sleep, but in the pleasing thoughts of the lovely face and charming grace of the disguised maiden on the other side. The steward bestowed that time in writing to his lord and lady what Sancho did and said, wondering no less at his actions than at his expressions, both which displayed a strange intermixture of discretion and simplicity. At last the Lord Governor was pleased to rise, and by Dr. Pedro Rizio's order, they brought him for his breakfast a little conserve and a draught of fair water, which he would have exchanged with all his heart for a good luncheon of bread and a bunch of grapes, but seeing he could not help himself, he was forced to make the best of a bad market and seemed to be content, though sorely against his will and appetite, for the doctor made him believe that to eat but little and that which was dainty, enlivened the spirits and sharpened the wit, and consequently such a sort of diet was most proper for persons in authority and weighty employments, wherein there is less need of the strength of the body than that of the mind. This sophistry served to famish Sancho, who, however, hungry as he was, by the strength of his slender breakfast, failed not to give audience that day, and the first that came before him was a stranger, who put the following case to him, the stewards and the rest of the attendants being present. My lord, said he, a large river divides in two parts one and the same lordship. I beg your honor to lend me your attention, for it is a case of great importance and some difficulty. Upon this river there is a bridge, at the one end of which there stands a gallows and a kind of court of justice, where four judges used to sit for the execution of a certain law made by the lord of the land and river, which runs thus. Whoever intends to pass from one end of this bridge to the other must first, upon his oath, declare whither he goes and what his business is. If he swear truth, he may go on, but if he swear false, he shall be hanged and die without remission upon the gibbet at the end of the bridge. After due promulgation of this law, many people, notwithstanding its severity, had ventured to go over this bridge, and as it appeared they swore true, the judges permitted them to pass unmolested. It happened one day that a certain passenger being sworn, declared that by the oath he had taken, he was come to die upon that gallows, and that was all his business. This put the judges to a nonplus, for, said they, if we let this man pass freely, he is forsworn, and according to the letter of the law, he ought to die, if we hang him, he has sworn truth, seeing he swore he was to die on that gibbet and then by the same law we should let him pass. Now your lordship's judgment is desired what the judges ought to do with this man, for they are still at a stand, 
not knowing what to determine in this case, and having been informed of your sharp wit and great capacity in resolving difficult questions, they sent me to beseech your lordship in their names to give your opinion in so intricate and naughty a case. To deal plainly with you, answered Sancho, those worshipful judges that sent you hither might as well have spared themselves the trouble, for I am more inclined to bluntness, I assure you, than sharpness, however, let me hear your question once more, that I may thoroughly understand it, and perhaps I may at last hit the nail upon the head. The man repeated the question again, and when he had done, Hark, honest man, said Sancho, either I am a very dunce, or there is as much reason to put this same person you talk of to death, as to let him live and pass the bridge, for if the truth saves him, the lie condemns him. Now I would have you tell those gentlemen that sent you, since there is as much reason to bring him off as to condemn him, that they even let him go free, for it is always more commendable to do good than hurt. Nor do I speak this of my own head, but I remember one precept, among many others, that my master Don Quixote gave me the night before I came to govern this island, which was, that when the scale of justice is even, or a case is doubtful, we should prefer mercy before rigor, and it has pleased God I should call it to mind so luckily at this juncture. For my part, said the steward, this judgment seems to me so equitable, that I do not believe Lycurgus himself, who gave the laws to the Lacedaemonians, could ever have decided the matter better than the great Sancho has done. And now, sir, sure there is enough done for this morning, be pleased to adjourn the court, and I will give order that your excellency may dine to your heart's content. Well said, cried Sancho, that is all I want, and then a clear stage and no favor. Feed me well, and then ply me with cases and questions thick and threefold, you shall see me untwist them and lay them open as clear as the sun. Sancho having plentifully dined that day, in spite of all the aphorisms of Dr. Tardiofura, when the cloth was removed, and came in express with a letter from Don Quixote to the governor. Sancho ordered the secretary to read it to himself and if there was nothing in it for secret perusal, then to read it aloud. The secretary having first run it over accordingly, my lord, said he, the letter may not only be publicly read, but deserves to be engraved in characters of gold, and thus it is. Don Quixote de la Mancha to Sancho Panza, governor of the island of Barataria. When I expected to have had an account of thy carelessness and blunders, friend Sancho, I was agreeably disappointed with news of thy wise behavior, for which I return thanks to heaven that can raise the lowest from their poverty and turn the fool into a man of sense. I hear thou governest with all discretion, and that, nevertheless, thou retainest the humility of the meanest creature. But I desire thee to observe, Sancho, that it is many times very necessary and convenient to thwart the humility of the heart for the better support of authority. For the ornament of a person that is advanced to an eminent post must be answerable to its greatness and not debased to the inclination of his former meanness. Let thy apparel be neat and handsome, even a stake, well dressed, does not look like a stake. I would not have thee wear foppish gaudy things, nor affect the garb of a soldier in the circumstances of a magistrate, but let thy dress be suitable to thy degree, and always clean and comely. To gain the hearts of thy people, I chiefly recommend two things, one is, to be affable, courteous, and fair to all the world, the other, to take care that plenty of provisions be never wanting for nothing afflicts or irritates more the spirit of the poor than scarcity and hunger. Do not put out many new orders, and if thou dost put out any, see that they be wholesome and good, and that they be strictly observed, for laws not well obeyed are no better than if they were not made, and only shew that the prince who had the wisdom and authority to make them had not the resolution to see them executed, 
and loss that only threaten and are not kept become like the log that was given to the frogs to be their king, which they feared at first, but at last scorned and trampled. On. Be a father to virtue, but a father-in-law to vice. Be not always severe, nor always merciful. Choose a mean between these two extremes, for that middle point is the center of discretion. Visit the prisons, the shambles, and the public markets, for the governor's presence is highly necessary in such places. Be a terror to the butchers, that they may be fair in their weights, and keep hucksters and fraudulent dealers in awe, for the same reason. Write to thy lord and lady, and shew thyself grateful, for ingratitude is the offspring of pride, and one of the worst corruptions of the mind, whereas he that is thankful to his benefactors gives a testimony that he will be so to God, who has done, and continually does him, so much good. My lady duchess dispatched a messenger on purpose to thy wife Teresa, with thy hunting suit, and another present. We expect his return every moment. I have been somewhat out of order by a certain encounter I had lately, not much to the advantage of my nose, but all that is nothing, for if there are necromancers that misuse me, there are others ready to defend me. Send me word whether the steward that is with thee had any hand in the business of the Countess Trifaldi, as thou wert once of opinion, and let me also have an account of whatever befalls thee, since the distance between us is so small. I have thoughts of leaving this idle life ere long, for I was not born for luxury and ease. A business has offered that I believe will make me lose the Duke and Duchess's favor, but though I am heartily sorry for it, that does not alter my resolution, for, after all, I owe more to my profession than to complaisance, and, as the saying is, amicus Plato, said magus amica veritas. I send thee this scrap of Latin, flattering myself that since thou camest to be a governor, thou mayest have learned something of that language. Farewell, and heaven keep thee above the pity of the world. Thy friend, Don Quixote de la Mancha. Sancho gave great attention to the letter, and it was highly applauded, both for sense and integrity, by everybody that heard it. After that, he rose from table, and calling the secretary, went without any further delay, and locked himself up with him in his chamber, to write an answer to his master Don Quixote, which was as follows. Sancho Panza to Don Quixote de la Mancha. I am so taken up with business, that I have not yet had time to let you know whether it goes well or ill with me in this same government, where I am more hunger starved than when you and I wandered through woods and wildernesses. My Lord Duke wrote to me the other day, to inform me of some spies that were got into this island to kill me, but as yet I have discovered none but a certain doctor hired by the islanders to kill all the governors that come near it. They call him Dr. Pedro Rizio de Anguero, and he was born at Tardiafura. His name is enough to make me fear he will be the death of me. The same doctor says of himself that he does cure diseases when you have them, but when you have them not, he only pretends to keep them from coming. The physic he uses is fasting upon fasting till he turns a body to a mere skeleton as if to be wasted to skin and bones were not as bad as a fever. In short, he starves me to death so that when I thought as being a governor to have plenty of good hot victuals and cool liquor and to repose on a soft feather bed, I am come to do penance like a hermit. I have not yet so much as fingered the least penny of money either for fees or anything else, and how it comes to be no better with me I cannot imagine, for I have heard that the governors who come to this island are wont to have a very good gift, or at least a very ransom given them by the town before they enter. And they say too that this is the usual custom, not only here, but in other places. 
Last night, in going my rounds, I met with a mighty handsome damsel in boy's clothes and a brother of hers in woman's apparel. My gentleman leader fell in love with the girl and intends to make her his wife, as he says. As for the youth, I have pitched on him to be my son-in-law. Today, we both designed to talk to the father, Juan Diego de la Lana, who is a gentleman and an old Christian every inch of him. I visit the markets as you advised me and yesterday found one of the hucksters selling hazelnuts. She pretended they were all new, but I found she had mixed a whole bushel of old, empty, rotten nuts among the same quantity of new. With that, I had judged them to be given to the hospital boys who know how to pick the good from the bad and give sentence against her that she should not come into the market for 15 days and people said I did well. I am mighty well pleased that my lady duchess has written to my wife Teresa Panza and sent her the token you mention. It shall go hard but I will requite her kindness one time or other. Pray give my service to her and tell her for me she has not cast her gift in a broken sack as something more than words shall shew. If I might advise you and had my wish there should be no falling out between your worship and my lord and lady, for if you quarrel with them, it is I must come by the worst for it. And since you mind me of being grateful, it will not look well in you not to be so to those who have made so much of you at their castle. If my wife Teresa Panza writes to me, pray pay the postage and send me the letter, for I mightily long to hear how it is with her and my house and children. Your worship's servant, Sancho Panza, the governor. The secretary made up the letter and immediately dispatched it. Then those who carried on the plot against Sancho combined together and consulted how to release him from the cares of government and Sancho passed that afternoon in making several regulations for the better establishment of that which he imagined to be an island. In short, he made so many wholesome ordinances that, to this day, they are observed in that place and called the constitutions of the great governor Sancho Panza. Chapter 82 A relation of the adventures of the second disconsolate or distressed matron, otherwise called Donna Rodriguez, with the letters of Teresa Panza to the Duchess and to her husband. Don Quixote's wounds being healed, he began to think the life he led in the castle not suitable to the order which he professed. He resolved, therefore, to set off for Saragossa, where, at the approaching tournament, he hoped to win the armor, the usual prize at the festivals of that kind. Accordingly, as he sat at table with the lord and lady of the castle, he began to acquaint them with his design, when behold two women entered the great hall clad in deep mourning from head to foot. One of them approaching Don Quixote threw herself at his feet where, lying prostrate and in a manner kissing them, she fetched such doleful sighs and made such lamentations that all present were not a little surprised. And though the Duke and Duchess imagined it to be some new device of their servants, yet perceiving with what earnestness the woman sighed and lamented they were in doubt and knew not what to think till the compassionate champion raising her from the ground made her to lift up her veil and discover what they least expected the face of Donna Rodriguez the duenna of the family and the other mourner proved to be her daughter whom the rich farmer's son had deluded. All those that knew them were in great admiration especially the Duke and Duchess for though they knew her simplicity they did not believe her so far gone in folly. At last, the sorrowful matron, addressing herself to the Duke and Duchess, may it please your graces, said she, to permit me to direct my discourse to this night, for it concerns me to get out of an unhappy business into which the impudence of a treacherous villain has brought us. With that the Duke gave her leave to speak, then, applying herself to Don Quixote, 
It is not long, said she, valorous knight, since I gave your worship an account how basely a young graceless farmer had used my dear child, and you then promised me to stand up for her and see her righted, and now I understand you are about to leave this castle in quest of the adventures heaven shall send you. And therefore, before you are gone nobody knows whither, I have this boon to beg of your worship that you would do so much as challenge this sturdy clown and make him marry my daughter according to his promise. Worthy matron, answered Don Quixote with a great deal of gravity in solemn form, moderate your tears or, to speak more properly, dry them up and spare your sighs for I take upon thee to see your daughter's wrongs redressed. Therefore, with my lord duke's permission, I will instantly depart to find out this ungracious wretch, and, as soon as he is found, I will challenge him and kill him if he persists in his obstinacy, for the chief end of my profession is to pardon the submissive and to chastise the stubborn, to relieve the miserable and destroy the cruel. Sir Knight, said the Duke, you need not give yourself the trouble of seeking the fellow of whom that good matron complains, for I already engage that he shall meet you in person to answer it here in this castle, where lists shall be set up for you both, observing all the laws of arms that ought to be kept in affairs of this kind, and doing each party justice, as all princes ought to do that admit of single combats within their territories. Upon that assurance, said Don Quixote, with your grace's leave, I, for this time, weave my punctilio of gentility, and, debasing myself to the meanness of the offender, qualify him to measure lances with me. With that, pulling off his glove, he flung it down into the middle of the hall, and the duke took it up, declaring, as he already had done, that he accepted the challenge in the name of his vassal fixing the time for combat to be six days after and the place to be the castle court, the arms to be such as are usual among knights, as lance, shield, armor of proof, and all other pieces, without fraud, advantage, or enchantment, after search made by the judges of the field. But, added the duke, it is requisite that this matron and her daughter commit the justice of their cause into the hands of their champion for otherwise there will be nothing done, and the challenge is void. I do, answered the matron. And so do I, added the daughter, all ashamed, and in a crying tone. The preliminaries being adjusted, and the duke having resolved with himself what to do in the matter, the petitioners went away, and the duchess ordered they should no longer be looked on as her domestics, but as ladies errant, that came to demand justice in her castle, and, accordingly, there was a peculiar apartment appointed for them where they were served as strangers to the amazement of the other servants, who could not imagine what would be the end of Donna Rodriguez and her forsaken daughter's undertaking. Presently in came the page that had carried the letters and the presents to Teresa Panza. The Duke and Duchess were overjoyed to see him returned, having a great desire to know the success of his journey. They inquired of him accordingly, but he told them that the account he had to give them could not well be delivered in public, nor in few words, and therefore begged their graces would be pleased to take it in private, and, in the meantime, entertain themselves with those letters. With that, taking out two, he delivered them to her grace. The superscription of the one was, these for my lady duchess, of I do not know what place, and the direction on the other, thus, to my husband Sancho Panza, governor of the island of Barataria. The duchess having opened her letter, read it aloud, that the whole company might hear what follows. My lady, the letter your honor sent me pleased me hugely, for, troth, it is what I heartily longed for. The string of coral is a good thing, and my husband's hunting suit may come up to it. All our town takes it mighty kindly, and is very glad that your honor has made my spouse a governor, though nobody will believe it, 
especially our curate, Master Nicholas the Barber, and Samson Carrasco the Bachelor. But what care I whether they do or no? So it be true, as it is, let everyone have their saying. Though it is a folly to lie, I had not believed it neither, but for the quarrel and the suit, for everybody here takes my husband to be adult, and cannot for the life of them imagine what he can be fit to govern, unless it be a herd of goats. Well, heaven be his guide, and speed him as he sees best for his children. As for me, my dear lady, I am resolved, with your good liking, to make hay while the sun shines, and go to court, to loll it along in a coach, and make my neighbors, that envy me already, stare their eyes out. And, therefore, good your honor, pray bid my husband send me store of money, for I believe it is dear living at court, one can have but little bread there for sixpence, and a pound of flesh is worth thirty maravedis, which would make one stand amazed. And if he is not for my coming, let him send me word in time, for my gossips tell me, that if I and my daughter go about the court as we should, spruce and fine, my husband will be better known by me than I by him, for many cannot choose but ask, what ladies are these in the coach? With that one of my servants answers, the wife and daughter of Sancho Panza, governor of the island of Barataria, and thus shall my husband be known, and I honored, far and near. You cannot think how I am troubled that we have gathered no acorns here away this year. However, I send your highness about half a pack, which I have culled one by one. I went to the mountains on purpose, and got the biggest I could find. I wish they had been as big as ostrich eggs. Pray let not your mightiness forget to write to me, and I will be sure to send you an answer, and let you know how I do and send you all the news in our village. My daughter Sanchica and my son kiss your worship's hands. Your servant, Teresa Panza. This letter was very entertaining to all the company, especially to the Duke and Duchess, insomuch that her grace asked Don Quixote whether it would be amiss to open the governor's letter, which she imagined was a very good one. The knight told her that, to satisfy her curiosity, he would open it, which being done, he found what follows. I received thy letter, dear Sancho, and I vow and swear to thee, as I am a Catholic Christian, I was within two fingers breadth of running mad for joy. When I heard thou wert me to govern her, I was so transported, I had like to have fallen down dead with mere gladness. For thou knowest sudden joy is said to kill as soon as great sorrow. I had the suit thou sentest me before my eyes, and the lady duchess's corals about my neck held the letter in my hands, and had him that brought them standing by me, and for all that, I thought what I saw and felt was but a dream. For who could have thought a goat herd should ever come to be governor of islands? But what said my mother? who a great deal must see, a great wall must live. My lady duchess will tell thee how I long to go to court. Pray think of it, and let me know thy mind, for I mean to credit thee there, by going in a coach. Neither the curate, the barber, the bachelor, nor the sexton will believe thou art a governor, but say it is all juggling or enchantment, as all thy master Don Quixote's concerns used to be, and Samson threatens to find thee out, and put this maggot of a government out of thy pate, and Don Quixote's madness out of his coxcomb. For my part, I do but laugh at them, and look upon my string of coral, and contrive how to fit up the suit thou sentest me into a gown for thy daughter. The news here is, that Baruca has married her daughter to a sorry painter, that came hither pretending to paint anything. The township set him to paint the king's arms over the town hall. He asked them two ducats for the job, which they paid him, so he fell to work, and was eight days adobing, but could make nothing of it at last, 
and said he could not hit upon such puddling kind of work and so gave them their money again. Yet for all this he married with the name of a good workman. The truth is, he has left his pencil upon it and taken the spade and goes to the field like a gentleman. Sanchika makes bone lace and gets her three halfpence a day clear which she saves in a box with a slit to go towards buying household stuff. But now she is a governor's daughter, she has no need to work for thou wilt give her a portion. The fountain in the market is dried up. A thunderbolt lately fell upon the pillory, there may they all light. I expect thy answer to this and thy resolution concerning my going to court. Thy wife, Teresa Panza. These letters were admired and caused a great deal of laughter and diversion and, to complete the mirth, at the same time the express returned that brought Sancho's answer to Don Quixote, which was likewise publicly read and startled and delighted all the hearers. Afterwards, the Duchess withdrew to know of the page what he had to relate of Sancho's village, of which he gave her a full account without omitting the least particular. Chapter 83 the toilsome end and conclusion of Sancho Panza's government. To think the affairs of this life are always to remain in the same state is an erroneous fancy. The face of things rather seems continually to change and roll with circular motion. Summer succeeds the spring, autumn the summer, winter the autumn, and then spring again. So time proceeds in this perpetual round only the life of man is ever hastening to its end, swifter than time itself, without hopes to be renewed, unless in the next, that is unlimited and infinite. For even by the light of nature, and without that of faith, many have discovered the swiftness and instability of this present being, and the duration of the eternal life which is expected. But this moral reflection of our author is here chiefly intended to shew the uncertainty of Sancho's fortune, how soon it vanished like a dream, and how from his high preferment he returned to his former low station. It was now but the seventh night, after so many days of his government, when the careful governor had bade again himself to his repose, sated not with bread and wine, but cloyed with hearing causes, pronouncing sentences, making statutes, and putting out orders and proclamations. Scarce was sleep beginning to close his eyes, when of a sudden he heard a great noise of bells and most dreadful outcries, as if the whole island had been sinking. Presently he started and sat up in bed and listened with great attention to try if he could learn how far this uproar might concern him. But. While he was thus hearkening in the dark, a great number of drums and trumpets were heard, and that sound being added to the noise of the bells and the cries, gave so dreadful an alarm that his fear and terror increased, and he was in a sad consternation. Quitting his bed, he ran and opened his chamber door, and saw about twenty men come running along the galleries with lighted torches in one hand, and drawn swords in the other, all crying out, Arm! My Lord Governor, arm. A world of enemies are got into the island, and we are undone unless your valor and conduct relieve us. Thus bawling and running with great fury and disorder, they got to the door where Sancho stood, quite scared out of his senses. What would you have me arm for? cried Sancho. Do I know anything of arms or fighting, think you? Why do you not rather send for Don Quixote, my master? He will dispatch your enemies in a trice. Alas, I understand nothing of this hasty service. For shame, my lord governor, said another, what a faint-heartedness is this. See, we bring you here arms offensive and defensive, arm yourself and march to the marketplace be our leader and captain as you ought, and shew yourself a governor. Why, then, arm me, 
and good luck attend me, quoth Sancho. With that they brought him two large shields, which they had provided, and tied the one behind upon his back, and the other before upon his breast, having got his arms through some holes made on purpose. Now the shields being fastened to his body, as hard as cords could bind them, the poor governor was cased up and immured as straight as an arrow, without being able so much as to bend his knees or stir a step. Then, having put a lance in his hand for him to lean upon and keep himself up, they desired him to march and lead them on and put life into them all, telling him that they did not doubt of victory since they had him for their commander. March, quoth Sancho, how do you think I am able to do it, squeezed as I am? These boards stick so plaguy close to me, I cannot so much as bend the joints of my knees, you must even carry me in your arms and lay me across or set me upright before some passage and I will make good that spot of ground either with this lance or my body. Fie, my lord governor, said another, it is more your fear than your armor that stiffens your legs and hinders you from moving. March on, it is high time, the enemy grows stronger and the danger presses. The poor governor, thus urged, endeavored to go forward, but the first motion he made threw him to the ground at full length, so heavily that he gave over all his bonds for broken, and there he lay like a huge tortoise in his shell, or a flitch of bacon between two boards, or like a boat overturned upon a flat with the keel upwards. Nor had those droll companions the least compassion upon him as he lay, but putting out the lights, they made a terrible noise and clattered with their swords and laid on so furiously upon his shields that if he had not shrunk his head into them for shelter, he had been in a woeful condition. Squeezed up in his narrow shell, he was in a grievous fright, praying from the bottom of his heart for deliverance from the unhappy trade of governing islands. At last, when he least expected it, he heard a cry dash victory victory. The enemy is routed. Now, my lord governor, rise, come and enjoy the fruits of conquest and divide the spoils taken from the enemy by the valor of your invincible arms. Help me up, cried poor Sancho in a doleful tone and when they had set him on his legs, let all the enemy I have routed, quoth he, be nailed to my forehead. I will divide no spoils of enemies, but if I have one friend here, I only beg he would give me a draught of wine to comfort me. Thereupon they gave him wine and took off his shields. After that, what with his fright and what with the toil he had endured, he fell into a swoon insomuch that those who acted this scene began to repent they had carried it so far. But Sancho recovering from his fit in a little time, they also recovered from their uneasiness. Being come to himself, he asked what it was a clock. They answered, it was now break of day. He said nothing but creeping along softly, for he was too much bruised to go along very fast, he got to the stable, followed by all the company, and coming to Dapple, he embraced the quiet animal gave him a loving kiss on the forehead, and with tears in his eyes, come hither, said he, my friend, thou faithful companion and fellow sharer in my travels and miseries, when thee and I consorted together, and all my cares were but to mend thy furniture and feed thy carcass, then happy were my days, my months, and years. But since I forsook thee, and clambered up the towers of ambition and pride, a thousand woes, a thousand torments have haunted and worried my soul. While Sancho was talking thus, he fitted on his pack saddle, nobody offering to say anything to him. This done, with a great deal of difficulty he mounted his ass and then, addressing himself to the steward, the secretary, the gentleman waiter and Dr. Pedro Rizio and many others that stood by make way gentlemen, said he, and let me return to my former liberty. Let me go, 
that I may seek my old course of life and rise again from that death which buries me here alive. I know better what belongs to plowing, delving, pruning, and planting of vineyards than how to make laws and defend countries and kingdoms. St. Peter is very well at Rome, which is as much as to say, let everyone stick to the calling he was born to. A spade does better in my hand than a governor's trenchion, and I had rather have a mess of plain porridge than lie at the mercy of an officious physic monger who starves me to death. I had rather solace myself under the shade of an oak in summer and wrap myself up in a double sheepskin in the winter at my liberty than lay me down with the slavery of a government in fine holland sheets and case my body in furs and sables. Heaven be with you, gentlefolks, and pray tell my Lord Duke for me that poor I was born and poor I am at present. I have neither won nor lost which is as much as to say, without a penny I came to this government, and without a penny I leave it quite contrary to what other governors of islands used to do when they leave them. Clear the way, then, I beseech you, and let me pass. This must not be, my lord governor, said Dr. Rizio, for I will give your honor a balsamic drink that is a specific against false dislocations, contusions, and all manner of bruises, and that will presently restore you to your former health and strength. And then for your diet, I promise to take a new course with you, and to let you eat abundantly of whatsoever you please. It is too late, Mr. Doctor, answered Sancho, you should as soon make me turn Turk as hinder me from going. No, no. These tricks shall not pass upon me again, every sheep with its like. Let not the cobbler go beyond his last, and so let me go, for it is late. My lord governor, said the steward, though it grieves us to part with your honor, your sense, and Christian behavior engaging us to covet your company, yet we would not presume to stop you against your inclination, but you know that every governor before he leaves the place he has governed, is bound to give an account of his administration. Be pleased, therefore, to do so for the time you have been among us, and then peace be with you. No man has power to call me to an account, replied Sancho, but my lord duke. To him it is that I am going, and to him I will give a fair and square account. And indeed, Going away so bare as I do, there needs no greater proof that I have governed like an angel. In truth, said Dr. Rizio, the great Sancho is in the right, and I am of opinion we ought to let him go, for certainly the Duke will be very glad to see him. Thereupon they all agreed to let him pass, offering first to attend him and supply him with whatever he might want in his journey either for entertainment or convenience. Sancho told them that all he desired was a little corn for his ass and half a cheese and half a loaf for himself, having occasion for no other provisions in so short a journey. With that, they all embraced him and he embraced them all, not without tears in his eyes, leaving them in admiration of the good sense which he discovered both in his discourse and unalterable resolution.